Nigeria goes into the new year still saddled with enormous lack of infrastructure burden. Despite the federal government celebrates a significant progress in the past area of road, rails and rehabilitation of existing assets, it has borrowed heavily. More than half of the annual estimates still going to debt servicing. Critically, Lagos Ibadan Expressway remains unfinished. The second Niger Bridge has been given a 2022 finish date, and the social discontent continues to feed from a growing perception of failure of governance across the states. Uh, joining us now to look at 2021 economic outlook regarding infrastructure, inclusive growth, and investment environment is uh, Balaji Balogu, Chief Executive Officer, Chapel Hill Denim. Uh, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, Happy New Year to you. Uh, happy New Year. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, let's just go straight to it this morning. I'd like to talk to you about infrastructure, uh, cost-benefit analysis of the infrastructure we have on ground, and the investment climate and meets various headwinds like the coronavirus, pandemic, oil prices, and other sundry issues in, in, in the world at large. I think when you, firstly, let me wish everyone a happy new year. Let me hope that, you know, 2021 Thank you. Thank you. is a year in which, you know, first and foremost, um, the leadership of our economy recognizes the importance that urgency, you know, plays um, in this marketplace. Um, and, you know, where also our political leaders um, just recognize that they you know, have to be more considerate in terms of the 203 million people who live in this country. And that's really where I'd like to start. You know, between last year and this year, we've probably added another five, you know, to six million people, um, you know, to Nigeria's population. When you think of what we've added in terms of, you know, um, real factor investment into the economy, it's completely insignificant. And when you think about Nigeria and you understand Nigeria's challenges, there are really fundamentally three simple ways in which you're going to lift 100 million people out of poverty. Um, the first of those um, is really investment-led, you know, which is to look at the base of infrastructure in the economy, to recognize that there are weaknesses in power, there are weaknesses in transportation networks, we have this incredible blessing, you know, of natural gas, and we have no gas, you know, infrastructure or energy infrastructure to convert it into energy and to convert it into money. Um, over and above that, we have this unbelievable blessing of young and talented people, yeah? And we do not have the broadband infrastructure that young and talented people feed on. So first and foremost, we've got to do something about infrastructure, and we've got to do it like yesterday. The second issue is to recognize that, you know, people who have no financial literacy and people who do not save and invest um, absolutely have no chance of lifting themselves out of poverty. And financial education or financial literacy is not a complicated thing. And all of our financial regulators in the market, plus the government, must recognize that when you look at Nigeria's low investment and savings per capita, we have to do something about it. And even people who don't have can save. It's really about knowledge. It's about a discipline. It's about science. You don't have to be wealthy to save. And that's one of the biggest myths um, you know, that we have to make people aware of, that you can start small. Um, you can start with little sums. You need to understand the, be the benefits of saving early. You need to understand the benefits of compounding. You need to understand what compounding can do to your wealth, no matter how small. And I think it's incumbent on the people that regulate our financial services sector that every single firm that operates in Nigeria's financial services sector, be you a bank, you know, be you an investment bank, an insurance company, a pension fund manager, we all have obligations to contribute to financial education. If people are financially literate, then to a large extent, um, they have a chance. The third element that we're going to have to fix is to do something very, very urgently about Nigeria's educational system. And people who have education have hope. And if there's nothing that, you know, the NSAS crisis taught all of us, it's really the fact that for the very, very first time, in Nigeria's recent history, um, people are lashing out because of a hopelessness. And that has never happened in this country. Um, this is a country, 
you know, where if you have some ability, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how you were born, you have a chance. This is probably the first time in our economic and social political history as a nation that if you're talented, if you're prepared to work hard, it's not enough. And that's just not acceptable. Um, so how are we going to ensure, firstly, that our educational system, into which there's very, very little investment outside of paying salaries, right, um, essentially prepares our children for this 21st century? How are we going to ensure that every young Nigerian growing up, for example, has the ability today um, to understand something that is going to help them in what will be primarily a digital environment. Let me ask you this question. You and I think about education in the traditional paradigms where we grew up, where we have to gather together under a tree or we have to gather together in a classroom to be taught by somebody. But have you ever thought about this mobile device, right, as a delivery channel for education? There are young people in Nigeria today, there are young people all over the world who have never been to formal schools, but are able to do things like coding because they learnt it on YouTube, or are able to cook, or are able to speak languages that aren't their mother tongue because they learnt it on YouTube. And this is the opportunity that every Nigerian child must have, and this is why infrastructure and broadband infrastructure is so critical. Well, I mean, I agree with you on all the points. Uh, you're absolutely correct. But as we try to make sense of uh, the economic outlook for 2021, I'd like your comments on the uh, budget 2021, uh, which the president signed into law. Uh, in terms of, do you think it's a realistic budget? The president himself described it as a deficit budget. And if you look at the details, yes. uh, Recurrent expenditure is still more than uh, capital expenditure. Uh, we're spending over three trillion to service yeah. debt. Yeah. And meanwhile, we're told that our debt uh, portfolio, total public uh, debt profile, uh, is uh, over 32 trillion. Yeah. And the Department of um, manage, uh, Debt Management uh, uh, Office yes. uh, is telling us that, look, it's uh, sustainable because we have a debt to uh, GDP ratio. Yeah that is still manageable, mm. but how about debt to government revenue ratio? Yes. I mean, what do you make of all of this? Do you Look, think that this I, budget can move us forward? I, I think the first thing that we must come to, you know, is a reality. Um, and that reality for me stares us bleakly in the face, has stared us, you know, bleakly in the face for a number of years. And, and these are the numbers. This is, you know, probably our biggest ever budget, right? Um, this budget basically translates to about 6 7% of the nation's GDP. Now, what does that mean? That means that, first and foremost, the government, as a factor of the economy, is small and is becoming less and less relevant. Then if that is the case, and 94% of the economy is the private sector and enterprise, what must the government recognize? The first is to recognize yeah, that you have to regulate, but in regulating, you need to get out of the way. You need to allow private capital and private enterprise, right, really drive things. Because first and foremost, not only are you insignificant, right, but let me share with you. If you put 100 naira, okay, through the economy, through the government, right, into the marketplace, right? Only 23 or 24 Naira of that 100 is going to finance development and growth. 75 or 76 Naira of that 100 is either paying government salaries for less than half a million employees or is servicing debt. So if you understand your problem, it is only someone who is not thinking clearly, that isn't thinking, how do, I, you know, how do I work against this problem? So the reality, first and foremost, number one, is our government's wallet is inadequate. So once you recognize our government's wallet is inadequate, then what must you do? You must behave like a market, like an economy, which wants to attract capital. 
And that capital starts off with domestic capital. So how you treat your domestic businesses, how large owners of businesses do not feel that we live in an environment where the government is against us or the government does not want us to prosper. Because by the way, right, there are 10 million people in employment in Nigeria. The government employs less than 1 million of them. So who is creating the jobs? It's the private sector. So who is doing the investments? It's the private sector. You sit there and you and I probably think the government is a person investing in, infra in infrastructure. But if you take all of the power plants that are sitting in private businesses, from Shell to Dangote Cement to Lafarge to the MTNs of this world, right? A variety of private businesses, Airtel, across this country. The first thing that you're going to find is that they're generating far more power, right? That is coming out of the discos and jenkos that are part owned by the government. So already today, with the exception of roads, airports, yeah, the rail, yeah, when you think about power, when you think about gas networks that function, when you think about broadband, yeah, when you think about even moving stock or rolling stock in transportation, whether it's buses and so on, the private sector is already a big factor. So why don't you then recognize that if I have this channel where if I spend 100, okay, let's even say that 20% of it leaks, okay? 70, 80% of it is going into investment and development. Whereas if you put it through this government channel, 76% of it is leaking. What do right-thinking people do? I think the answer is quite clear to you. Mm. Indeed. So you have identified the challenges and you have identified solutions. Unfortunately, I have to put that question back to you. What is driving the disconnect? So we understand there are these challenges and the solutions are staring us in the face, but it's not happening. What is the problem? Why is government not finding the solutions? What's driving that disconnect? It's a very, very basic description. You know, they might give you and I ingredients to cook the same pot of stew, okay? And we might both stay in the kitchen for the same 30 minutes and we cook the stew. But because I put the pepper in first, before the onions, before the oil, my stew will taste different from yours. And what I will say very, very simply is that for the first time in Nigeria's recent economic history, and probably for the first time since the late 70s and the early 80s, everybody understands what the big issues are. But what we need to do is to go from an understanding of the big issues to understanding what the prioritization of those issues are, right? And the foundation of everything, if I might put it to you very simply, and this is proven in the 30 plus nearly 40 countries that have managed to industrialize themselves since the end of the Second World War. The prioritization of it is that you start off with a massive, rapid, sustained investment in your nation's infrastructure. That massive, sustained investment in your nation's infrastructure is typically financed in local currency. Because if you don't do that, all you end up doing is impoverishing your nation. Because you're creating all these infrastructure, you're financing it in dollars, the users are paying in Naira, and every year your currency is devaluing against the dollar, so you're getting poorer and poorer, and your users cannot afford to use all this beautiful infrastructure that you've built. Now, you start off with that foundation of infrastructure because infrastructure then brings investments. Investors, by and large, right, don't build infrastructure, yeah? And to a large extent, some investors will focus on infrastructure investing, okay? But if investors want to invest on top of a base of infrastructure. If you bring power, you'll be amazed at the manufacturing investments that you're going to attract. You'll be amazed at how power changes your agriculture from low value 
agriculture, which is what we have today, right, to high value, because you now have the ability to process and to preserve all of the agricultural produce, okay, that you are producing. If you bring transportation, you have the ability to take that agriculture from farmyard, right, to tables in the city, to airports, to seaports, to export it and turn it into valuable dollars. And this blessing of agriculture that you have, that actually as a factor of your economy is a lot larger than your oil is, right, will begin to translate to real money. And it's the same way even with areas that you don't think of as investable, okay, like education. Education today is about two infrastructure elements. It's about power and it's about broadband, right? And you imagine today, how does a child get educated in the world without access to the internet? It's, it's just not feasible. And any child that you are denying access to the internet in 2021, honestly, it's criminal. It's like not feeding them. Yeah? So you need to solve power. You need to solve broadband. Even think about security where our nation has been so incompetent. Okay? There are three elements to security. Two of them are infrastructure-driven. And only one is weaponry. Okay? There's intelligence. Okay, and intelligence is all about listening devices and cameras. Okay, without listening devices and cameras, in other words, you need to have electricity and you need to have broadband. If you can see things moving before they happen and you can listen and understand what people are planning, to a large extent you can react. All we are doing is we're throwing weaponry and men at security. And the most important part of the security infrastructure, right, which actually starts with intelligence, is completely defunct. Yeah? And it's not difficult to solve these problems. So even your security, your education, your retail, your manufacturing, your agriculture, your mining. Look, today they tell us in the Ministry of Solid Minerals that we have this incredible blessing yeah, of all of these minerals. But they're sitting under the ground, and most of them are typically in the middle of the country. Okay? In the middle of the country, you need to get them to a port, because it's when you get them to a port that someone can pay you dollars for them. Okay? So you need a rail network or some transportation network to ship it. Then it's not as the mineral comes out from the ground that you sell it. Whether it's just cleaning it alone, right, or adding value to it. You need electricity to do that. So every single thing that you think of, right, starts off from that base of infrastructure. And if you look at the 36, 38 countries that have industrialized since the end of World War II, okay, they all went through a rapid, sustained, accelerated, above invest, you know, above normal, investment in infrastructure for like a decade, they change the basis and the foundation of the infrastructure platform of the economy. And when you do that, what it then does is it attracts investments, both private and local. Then you've got to recognize that it's not just some of the things that we're dealing with, right, in making the business environment, right, more friendly, that are important. Actually, if you go and look at those World Bank, you know, studies about ease of doing business. The biggest decimal inside all of the ease of doing business things is infrastructure. So you start off with that foundation. And when you start off with that foundation, you give the economy a chance. Healthcare today, right, without electricity, without broadband, is hampered. And there's nothing that you think about. I will explain to you that there's an infrastructure problem in there. Okay. Let me even tell you, just before I round up, yeah? You and I think about Fulani herdsmen today. Would you be shocked if I say to you that there are two infrastructure elements inside the problems of migration, right, and Fulani herdsmen today? Fulani herdsmen are pursuing water, okay? Because 
water supply is not available. So they're moving further and further away from the Chad Basin, which had always been, you know, this big body of water that because of climate change, right, is shrinking and shrinking all the time. And they're moving towards the coast to find water. But let me also tell you what part of the problem is, right? Cattle should not be moving. It is meat, right, that has been killed and processed and coal chain infrastructure that should be moving. Your country today has little or no coal chain infrastructure. Because of that as a result, when we even think about the applicability to COVID, some of the vaccines which are being produced globally today for COVID, we have no ability today to receive them, not to talk of distributing them to people because we have no cold okay. chain infrastructure. Okay. So every single facet that you think about, the foundation starts from that, and then you build investment on top of infrastructure, and even education is substantially enhanced by infrastructure. I mean, very valid point you've made there. I mean, and it was a good thing you talked about intelligence, because even if you look at the Second World War, what won the war uh, for the Allied forces was the fact that a certain Alan Turing could be able to crack the German Moss code and from then on, the war just changed and it turned on its head. And uh, speaking of that, we've had, you know, some certain level of infrastructure in the past. I'll give you an instance. Just for instance, in the 1920s, when the teen industry opened up in Jos, there used to be a power company, creation company, uh, that churned up power in Jos. And that company still exists till date. In fact, that's one of the oldest power plants, I think about Nasot or something. And it used to provide infrastructure for companies like NASCO, owned by the Nasserodin family, and you had a lot of trade going out there in Jos. But because of government policies, it's not the same again. You can see what NASCO, that used to be the second largest employer of people in the north, has, after the textile in Kaduna, had lost over the years because of policies. I want you to speak through to policy uh, being a detrimental effect on the business of people. Policy is so fundamental um, and so foundational. And you only have, you talk about the north. If you and I looked at the North 10 years ago, okay, the big businesses, UNTL in Kaduna, NASCO that you talk about, you know, um, PAN in Kaduna, all of these businesses today either do not exist or they are substantial shadow. At one point in time, I think about a business like UNTL. UNTL used to employ over 130,000 people in this country, yeah? I'm not sure that there are many big businesses in Nigeria today, you know, that employ 100,000. I don't even think there's one, yeah? Now, all of these businesses either were killed by infrastructure issues, right? They would bring in their own infrastructure, right? Because they were bring in their own infrastructure, their cost of factor productivity was going up, you know, all the time, right? And government policy left the you know, barriers open, yeah? So it was possible for cheaper imports produced at bigger volume in China to come and destroy their businesses. And we have to think about what we do from a policy framework. The first perspective is to recognize, right, that if you don't have, you have to be welcoming, right? And pardon me, and I hope that nobody takes offense if I use an expression like this. If you're looking for, or you're a beggar, right, you cannot be anything but humble. So what do I mean by that simply? We need investment. We need investment from local businesses, right? And there are local businesses that disturb them, tax overtax them, you know, frustrate them, put EFCC on them every single year. They are investing in this country and they're creating jobs. Those are the real saviors of this economy. Not some people wearing Agbada and Baba and Riga around the nation and tying rapper who think that they control power. When I think about who the leaders of the economy are, right? I don't look to people in government. I look to the leaders of the private sector. Those are the real heroes of our marketplace. So the first thing we must do is to recognize that the investment environment must be conducive for those people to continue to put their money in here every single year, and that money doesn't go and sit, 
right, invested in other nations, right, or invested in consumerism, okay? The second element is to recognize that as, as a nation, okay, there is nothing wrong with people who either have built a business, right, or invented something, right, or created jobs being successful, okay? And as a nation, we must not make them feel uncomfortable. When your domestic entrepreneurs are comfortable here, then you've got to realize that you need to attract international investment. And why do I say so? Across the world today, um, there is somewhere around $130 trillion in investments globally. Approximately 23, 25% of that is attracting negative yield or zero. So in other words, the same scenario that you saw here just before the end of the year, where our interest rates got as low as 0.035. That's the reality, right, in many nations across the world. Japan is an ex extremely good example, okay? And all of these people, okay, are hunting, okay, for a home for that capital. Secondly, many of them also recognize that they need to help Africa. They need to help Africa not because it's charity, but actually they need to help Africa because it is the continent of the future. First and foremost, it's where the majority of the world's youngest people live, and these are all aging populations. The second thing, it's where so much of the world's mineral and agricultural wealth or natural resources reside. And so many of these countries require that mineral wealth, right, either for manufacturing and other needs, or they require your agricultural resources for food security, okay? So over and above the fact that they're looking for yield, right, there are also logical reasons that are important for them to invest in you. There's a third reason, and let me explain that one. They want to invest in you so that you all sit in your nations and you don't migrate to them. <laughs> if a million, it sounds very funny, but if a million Nigerians land in any country in the world, you will change the base of that country. If you land in a Southern European nation today, because they don't behave like us and because people have a mindset where they must support you socially, you are going to cost that nation over a trillion dollars. Very correct, uh, Mr. Balogun. In fact, I agree with you about the politics of migration and also your point about Africa as the last frontier. But I hope uh, we'll have the right kind of leaders across the continent to be able to take maximum advantage of that potential. Thank you very much for joining us on the morning show today. Thank you very much indeed.